dedicated to each and every one of you who appreciate a great glass of wine. You know what I mean? One day, let's raise a glass to the beginning of another week. It's time to unscrew, uncork, or savor a bottle. Let's begin exploring the wine glass. Merry Christmas. I have the perfect gift for you under the tree today. I am sharing the conversation between winemakers who have a special place in their hearts for Cabernet Franc. This past December 4th, Cab Franc Day, we got together by way of Zoom and shared our love of the greatest grape variety on earth. We talk about why we love the grape, we get a little geeky about soil and canopy management, and talk about our passion projects. I hope you enjoy the conversation. If you listen to a lot of podcasts, you know that many ask for Patreon. We do not plan on doing this, but we do ask you to support the podcast by leaving a review. It takes only a few seconds of your time, but means so much to the show. The next best way to support Explore in the Wine Glass is to tell your friends. If you enjoy the podcast, your wine-loving friends will too. Finally, don't forget to head to the website, exploringthewineglass.com, to read the blog and to sign up for the newsletter so you can keep up on all of the happenings. Hey everybody, I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program, Spanish wine scholar, Somme service, champagne and Cote de Ron specialist, and a WSET level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials, as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time to swipe, subscribe, rate, and review. Stay in the know about all things wine by visiting my website, exploringthewineglass.com. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. Very, very special. You are so special. You even... All right. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, happy Cap Franc Day. Yay. Happy Cap Franc Day. By far, in my opinion, the best day on the face of the earth. And, you know, it's just pretty darn good. Uh, so a little housekeeping. As I let you in, we are going to um, try to keep the cameras so that people can see everybody. Um, I really don't know how it works when uh, I'm not the per, you know, I'm not in there, but uh, let's try to keep cameras off unless you are part of the panel. That allows everybody else to, I think, to see the uh, panel larger. Please make sure you are muted uh, until it, um, so that we are not hearing background noise, dogs, cats, I don't know, chickens, turkeys, whatever. Um, and we will, uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat, uh, which I am really bad at uh, paying attention to. So I've already asked the panel to help me um, pay attention to that. And uh, so welcome everybody to, this is actually the eighth, if my math is correct, the eighth Cab Franc Day celebration. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say we're all drinking. Um, uh, see, this is what happens, Stephen, when you don't have the green screen behind you. Uh, so, <laughs> so let's raise a glass if you Imagine. have it in your hand. <laughs> and let's say happy Cap Franc Day, Slancha. Slancha, happy Cap Franc Day. All right. So today um, we are celebrating... Uh, what I think everybody on this panel believes is the best grape variety on the face of the <laughs> earth. And so we have countries here outside of the United States, which is phenomenal. So um, we have, oh, where did you go? Oh, there you are, Ricardo. I lost you for a second. So Ricardo is from Chile. So if you can just give us a little brief, like one minute, go to the winery that you represent. And we'll kind of just go around that, just a brief introduction of the winery itself. And then we'll carry on. Perfect, perfect. Well, I'm Ricardo Ulrich, and I'm here for uh, La Rosa Winery from Chile. We're located in the Cachapoal Valley. That's central, close to Santiago an hour south and another half an hour west to the coast. Uh, the winery is going to celebrate 200 years next year, so 2024. It's the uh, seventh generation already in the same family. 
And if you if you look back to the history of the winery, it started with the conquistadores, uh, Pedro de Valdivia. Then the next recorded owner was the first president of Chile in 1810. And then the Osa family, which is still the current owner of the, of the winery. So we're very uh, excited to be here. And of course, we do a Cabernet Franc. And I did, you know, I did my little research. You don't just do a Cabernet Franc. You kind of kick some serious butt with your Cabernet Franc. And we will that's get right. into that because that's pretty impressive. And I'm going to stick to outside of the country. So, David, Hi, welcome, welcome back. So good to see you <laughs> Thank again. Thank you. Yeah, it's David here from uh, Paradise Rescued. I am actually sitting in Melbourne, Australia at the moment. Um, the picture behind me, though, is the real thing. That is our beautiful little one hectare vineyard organic certified vineyard in Bordeaux, France, the uh, the original home of uh, Cabernet Franc before it put its feelers out uh, around the world. And uh, part of our origins and all of our story uh, really is created around our Cabernet Franc sto story. That's where we started. Our one brand continue to, to go and move forward. And we're once again proud, pleased and, um, and humbled to be part of the Cabernet Franc Day uh, experience and annual festivity welcome thank you uh and david actually was when i first started cap Fronte, david was probably one of the first people to get on board and say yes it's about time there's a day to celebrate this great so i'm so happy to see you today and i'm just going to go through my corners so peter yes tell us about your winery well, I've been enjoying wine for over 30 years. I come from tech. Um, I met a, my brother from another mother who is a techie too. He owned several companies and started his own winery 20 years ago. And I produce everything I do out of his location. So I get to use uh, high-end equipment most boutique winemakers don't get to use last August of 2022. Um, but my first release, and thank you very much, Laurie, um, after Cab Franc Day last year, um, I met Michael Kelly because of Cab Franc Day last year. And my 2020 won Best in Class Double Gold in that competition. So I'm really happy with that right now. And plus, I met Carlos and other bloggers on that. And Carlos is phenomenal. Um, and also, so is the wine chick out of Dallas. Yes. Um, wonderful people. And you're going to be drinking my 21 and a barrel sample of my 22. And that 22, I hope you love. I, I'm growing to love that right now. That 2021 is awesome. That's out of Chalk Hill. Juan Gamino's Vineyard in Chalk Hill. All right. And we're going to talk about soil and all of that good stuff. We're going to get into that, that geekiness. Um, all right, Leah, you're next little brief Hello. intro. I know there's so much about you. It's ah, so. Oh, sorry. Do can you hear the dog? No, I heard okay. a bark, but we're good now. Okay, good. <laughs> Trying to keep it under control. Um, hello, I'm Leah Jorgensen. I am not the first person to make Cabernet Franc in Oregon, but I am the only person, the only winemaker right now dedicated to Cabernet Franc in Oregon. Um, I'm based in Newburgh, but I source my fruit from the Rogue and Applegate Valleys in Southern Oregon. Um, and I have some really extraordinary um, geological stories around that with subduction and um, it's 250 million years old, giving us some really cool ancient marine uh, fossils and shells and shell imprints in some of the sites that we work with. I don't own a vineyard at the moment and I lease space at uh, my friend and mentor, Drew Voigt's winery here in McMinnville, Oregon. Uh, I worked for Drew at Shea Wine Cellars, oh gosh, several years ago. So anyways, um, I'm the Oregon representative here today. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank and you. next is uh, Michael. And disclosure for those who are watching and don't know, he is my husband. And together we own Dracina Wine. So just putting that disclosure out there. Full disclosure, it's like uh, disclosing that you own part of the company, right? <laughs> so thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Lori. Um, so Michael Bud, uh, like Lori said, I'm the other half of Dracina Wines. Um, Lori's the one that keeps me honest and keeps my palate in check um, in, uh, in developing our Cab Franc. Um, this is actually kind of exciting because 2023 is our official 10 year anniversary of our first wine released, our first Cab Franc released in 2013. So um, looking to do a lot of different things this year, um, clearly with the help of Stephen and Leah and trying to do some 
different things. Um, but based in Paso Robles, so all of our fruit comes from Paso Robles. Um, we've sourced both from the east and west side of Paso. Um, it always drives me a little crazy. Uh, anybody who's been to Paso Robles that they call an east and a west side, but it's divided by a highway. Um, it's not a river, it's not a mountain range, it's the highway that makes the, the, the influence different. Why? Um, it certainly does, um, but that's a little bit about us. Um, we're both educated science, science wise, as well as uh, educated enology wise with uh, UC Davis, as well as um, all of the great winemakers around the world that um, are open to sharing their knowledge, which is, which is just a great thing and what makes the industry so great. And Steven, who literally talked me off of a ledge yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do for friends, right? <laughs> Stephen Mirasu uh, of Stephen Kent Winery in the Livermore Valley. Uh, a great pleasure uh, talking with you folks again this year. Uh, Leah, who's a close friend, and and Lori and Mike, who are becoming close friends as well. Uh, Cabernet Franc's a dream. It, it's... Uh, it is the most expressive variety that I know. Uh, my family's been making wine in California for 170 years now. We're the oldest winemaking family in the country. We started making wine six years before Abraham Lincoln was president in San Jose and have been in the Livermore Valley for almost 30 years now and really believe deeply in, in Livermore's ability to properly ripen Cabernet Franc. Um, uh, it, it's a it's an area that people have a misapprehension about. They think it's really a, a hot place, but the further east you go in the valley, the colder it gets. Uh, diurnal temperature ranges are, are 40 and 50 degrees during harvest, and I think it's a perfect place to grow Cab Franc. Uh, Stephen Kent Winery started out as a Cabernet house back in 1996, and um, it has pivoted. Uh, pivot may be too strong a word. It's moved in the right direction now over the last 10 years or so toward Cabernet Franc and toward a desire to be, um, to devote the rest of my career and the career of my wife and my son, uh, generation seven of the family in the business, uh, to, to making the most beautiful grape and, and a beautiful expression thereof. It's nice to see all of you. Nice to be here again. And uh, I was laughing because yesterday at the Cap Franc celebration in Paso, Steve came in and they were talking and uh, somebody was talking about the oldest um, wineries uh, in Livermore and everything. And I was like, but he's, well, not you. And I said it again yesterday, I'm like, but he's seriously, <laughs> feel that way after time. but not you, <laughs> not you specifically. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look like I'm 180 years old. Hey, you're looking, you're looking great if you're that old. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. <laughs> All right, so we're just gonna, I'm gonna dive right in. And the first thing, so um, Ricardo, with, with Vino La Rosa, it's six generations and Pachapoal? Pachapoal, that's Ooh. right. All right, I said it right, sort of, kind of. Um, let's talk about the terroir and then that's gonna allow all of our other winemakers to come on in and talk about the terroir and what, is why we get Cab Franc from where we get it from. Yeah, so uh, where we are located, um, we're located in the, in the between the hills, uh, between the Los Andes uh, mountain range and the coastal range, uh, about, I would say, 100 kilometers from the coast. Um, and we have a very diverse uh, soil type there. Um, the 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 soil that that's present there in Peumo is a is a mix of volcanic soil in some places mostly volcanic soil i mean these are these are soils that rose from the sea level about a 100 million years ago and uh it's called the pluton which is a it's a eruption that didn't go out but stayed under the surface and over time it just elevated yeah and with the fraction and, and and the pressure geological pressure it kind of cracked and this is where our cap frank is being uh, planted today so it's a it's kind of a a, so, a, a volcanic soil that's being uh, in decomposition so it's cracked and that's where the root system goes down and 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 gets all the minerals so it's a very rich uh, mineral soil basically with huge amounts of iron, mostly iron. If you go north from Santiago and Chile, you get more presence of uh, calcium 
and to the south it's more the driving the driving mineral is is iron um so basically basically what we we've been always well known for carmener which is a, a grape that's most almost unique to chile and about 10 years ago we started exploring uh, the soil types in our in our estate which is a pretty large estate i mean we have 600 hectares planted to to vines uh, of a total of 12,000 hectares altogether now this is a size that you have to imagine uh, comes from the time of the conquistadores so you wouldn't be able to go, go out now and, and acquire an estate of 12,000 hectares but that's what is part of the family estate. And of these 600 are planted with vines. Um, the Cornellana estate, which is one of the three states we we, are located, we have, is a pure volcanic soil. And um, as we were doing our studies about the soil types within the different uh, states, uh, this one popped out as a very particular soil type, the volcanic soil. And we started planting Carmener, Cabernet Franc, some Syrah there, and it has turned out that the the the, the variety that best shows and that does the best there is the Cab Franc. So, what what about the other winemakers here? The soils that you have, um, I don't want to like pick people. I don't want to be in school, but like, how do you think those soils affect the vines themselves? Anyone? Anyone? Don't make me pick, please. I, I, this is Peter, and I, I'd say it, you're going to see today how they affect differently because all three of the ones that I did, the 20, the 21, and the 22, are different soils. One is volcanic, another one is sandy loam, another one is gold-rich fine. Um, they're, they're all different, but they're all different AVAs as well, so it's hard to judge, other than the fact that you, you do get the difference in the wine significantly. Okay, so I'm going to back you up a track. What was the third one? Um, the third one is actually a gold rich fine. Gold. Okay, so that's a newbie to me. So, what? Gold what rich is fine is usually usually what you find in Russian River, and oh, okay. it's it's actually in Alexander Valley as well. Um, I I mean it's around the world, but it, it, you find it a lot in Russian River. So we get it a lot with Pinot Noir. Um, I have not found a Cab Franc in Russian River, but I I'm willing to find one. Um, I just I just found one in Knights Valley too, adjacent to my Alexander Valley one. So I'm constantly trying to get these different vineyards to see how they taste different. But the soil affects them greatly. Absolutely. Now, Leah, you you are mostly in the Rogue Valley, right? But you have Applegate, the Van Duzer Corridor. Like, so how do you see those differences? Well, the Van Duzer Quarter, I exclusively get Gamay Noir from. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, Maybe I need the, to read better when I'm reading the website. It's okay. It's a, <laughs> no, I think you've got enough to do. <laughs> You're busy. Um, you know, thank you. The, uh, but I, I, most of my fruit is from Rogue Valley, and then I have um, select fruit from the Applegate Valley, and they flank each other. They're they're very close. Some some unique differences. Um, certainly with the, the vineyards that I work with in the Rogue Valley, um, we found um, in particular a, a really gold mine, if you will, in Craterview Ranch. Um, and this is a site that's about a mile and a half outside of the little town of Jacksonville, Oregon, which is this charming gold rush town. It's tiny and it's more famous for its International Shakespeare Festival. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ashland and Jacksonville, I should say. <clears throat> but um, it, there was a subduction that happened 250 million years ago. We know about the big one that they always talk about on the Pacific with the Juan de Foca plates. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, and so that subduction, instead of hitting straight on it, you know, it, it, instead of the uh, the plates hitting straight on, there's a subduction where one plate goes over. And and with that, it it it's pretty violent. It, bring, it brought up about... Um, a bunch of ocean bottom material as far as the Cascade Range in a fan. And so there are parts of the Rogue Valley um, that have these amazing deposits of limestone, of um, shell imprints, shell, um, different mollusk, mollusk shells, fossils um, that are 250 million years old. And it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So that's pretty unique to what I have in the Rogue. Uh, and I will just say this, when we talk about my state is far more well-known for Pinot Noir. 
And, uh, you know, just like the great Burgundy houses, they, you know, they look at the at Oregon and, you know, Oregon is not Burgundy, but we can make connections. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to share this story that the Southern Oregon Rogue Valley, it's got all kinds of different personalities. One certainly that pairs nicely with Rogue varietals, I'm sorry, uh, Roan varietals as well. But there are pockets like Crater View Ranch where it makes sense that you have get, um, Cabernet Franc Sauvignon Blanc in these, in these sites. And so yesterday, um, a comment came up uh, about Oregon Cabernet Franc, and uh, somebody asked about Willamette Valley. Is there, mm -hmm. is it there? Is it not supposed to be there? Is it there? Are, there are a few producers who've planted in um, in the Willamette Valley. Um, just with my experience, um, I I. I think that the in Southern Oregon, we while it's not a hotter region by far, I mean, people think Southern Oregon is a lot warmer than the Willamette Valley. We just have longer, more degree days of sunshine. Yeah. And so that longer exposure of sun gives it a, just the right amount of, of length for ripening, for fully ripening. So when I pick, I pick based on flavor, not based on bricks. Y'all know this. We're um, going to get into so, that. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you have the right amount of days, you need a certain amount of days for that grape to ripen. Um, and I just don't feel like it can get to that same um, ripening level in the Willamette Valley. I mean, you know, global warming is happening. So we've got all kinds of interesting things that are turning us on our head. But in general, I tend to think that the Willamette Valley, while some people are getting curious about trying different varietals, I just feel like for me, I'm sticking with Rogue Valley, Applegate Valley, Southern Oregon. And that, <laughs> that I like how you just said that for me, because as winemakers, where you can only produce wine, you're not making wine that you don't like, or I hope no, no winemaker is making wine that they don't like, right? Um, so you have to go to your palate and you have to go to what you believe is best for the wine that you enjoy. Right. Hey, uh, Mike, what about uh, Paso? What do we got there? I mean, <clears throat> our two vineyards that we're sourcing from in Paso, we don't get the same. The, the two vineyards are, are based on calcareous soils. And most of Paso is based on calcareous soils. Um, just off topic, the difference, we've noticed the difference. I've noticed the difference. Um, a vineyard that has been planted some between 25 and 30 years ago versus a vineyard that it's on its fourth leaf. Um, and I find huge differences between those two vineyards and the kind of fruit that you're getting off of that just by vine age um, and the flavor profiles that you see. Um, so that's where I personally, that's what we're seeing on our side from uh, uh, a Paso side. But most of Paso is going to be based on calcareous soils. And we choose, uh, we are all on the east side for the you know, that's, that's where our fruit is. So we, uh, we are agreeing with the degree days. We are actually in the two warmest. So we're in the Estrella district and Geneseo. So the, the two warmest districts that there are. Um, so uh, David, how about over there and over there? Um, <laughs> most of my views on the, on the word terroir are relatively controversial. So I'll, I'll keep some of that to a moment. on your just the right postcode or whatever you you <laughs> your terroir is 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 given a different rating automatically but my observation and one of the, the the brilliant things about cabernet franc is the fact that it has that ability to succeed in a variety of different soils and climates and everything you know geography perhaps not if you point it the wrong way i'm not sure you get the right answer but you know for, for soils and climate you can start in canada you can get to oregon you can go down towards california if you cross the atlantic you you find yourself quite happily starting the loire valley going down to bordeaux going further south to the long dock into italy and across to hungary and, and each one of those will have different soil um, majority of our research in the last 12 to 18 months has been focused around that whole topic of soil. And whatever you've got there, border is, is, is a classic sort of clay and, and, and limestone underneath, um, sometimes mixed at the top, varies again, you know, by, by the kilometer. Um, but the, the key factor in there, if you're going to produce good Cab Franc, you're going to produce any of Cab Franc's children's great wines as well. The secret is, is how you manage that soil. 
And uh, I'm neither a winemaker, I'm neither a, a vigneron, but I'm rapidly trying to become a, an agrobiologist. But that is where success lies in my view. And um, I did have to do the vigneron and part of the winemaking bit this year for a number of reasons. And it, it is always just fascinating to get close to the soil and see what it is doing up close up. And um, yeah, the, the, the potential for Cabernet Franc across a lot of those different areas is is immense. So uh, we we are actually um, sourcing Cabernet Franc from the Livermore Valley from four or five different vineyards. Livermore is not a very big place uh, uh, as the crow flies, but it, it is the valley floor in Livermore is about 650 feet above sea level. So it's not, it's significantly higher than Napa Valley, for instance, and, and more, more of a bowl shaped growing area than a V like you get in Napa. Vineyards are planted up to about a thousand feet like the, the our our foremost vineyard Gilmetti vineyard in the eastern foothills of Livermore uh is about a thousand feet above sea level planted in six different soil types the Cabernet Franc there uh very very loamy soil very fine grained light brown soils we've got a lot of clay in the upper half of the vineyard uh where we grow some Merlot um uh more of an alluvial area is, is Livermore Valley it, it's um a, an area that I think um there, there's a lot to learn you've been i've been in the business for a while now but you know i know i know hopefully yeah, you're 180 years old 80 years old um, <laughs> i know one one hundredth of what i'll end up knowing down the road uh but you know the the, the relationship between soils and and uh all the other aspects of terroir are still a mystery to me i'm still trying to wrap my mind about uh, around what this all means clonal material age of the vineyard uh, water you know, deficit, irrigation, uh, nutrition—all of these factors uh, affect overall quality of the fruit. We get um, in Livermore again, kind of misapprehension about how warm it is. It's really not. It, it's it's a region three climate, uh, but the eastern foothills are really kind of where all the the cold air from San Francisco Bay pools in the afternoon, right on top of Gilmetti Vineyard. So it's an area that that we butt out in. You know, in in mid-April, and then we're harvesting into mid-November, normally speaking, in this particular site. And it's our primary site in Livermore Valley. Um, we also we also uh, get Cabernet Franc from the Santa Cruz Mountains, so a very different growing area. Um, from Bates Ranch and Zayante Vineyards, Zayante sort of 1,300 feet above sea level, right in the middle of the Santa Cruz Mountain, the, the range right there on the coast, and then Bates Ranch kind of looking the other way toward the ocean uh, at about two or 300 feet. Uh, where the Cab Franc blocks are, so it, it's a, it's we're in a really neat phase in our Cab Franc development, where we're getting an opportunity of looking at a variety of different growing areas, trying to figure out crop loads, trying to figure out timing of harvest, trying to figure out a lot of these different factors that that um, we hope ultimately mean really fine examples of Cabernet Franc and very specific examples of Cab Franc vineyard by vineyard. Yeah. As we go along, I, I love hearing how all of these different regions have different soil types, but and how they get expressed in the into the vine, basically. And so I'm going to go a little geeky, but before I go geeky, um, I do want to introduce. So we have Allison here, and I I adore Allison, and I, I just really do. Uh, so Allison is not a winemaker, but I mean, I say that I am as rabbit hole down, you know, as down the rabbit hole of Cab Franc there is. And I believe you guys who are on here are that far down, but Allison also is. And so she is the Cab Franc Chronicles. And she, you, I don't think you can get more love for Cab Franc than Allison does. Um, so I just wanted to, if you did not know Allison, I just wanted to introduce you to her. Um, she's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Laurie. Very kind of you. It's a pleasure uh, to, to drop in to your, your very cool nerdy chat with regards to Cabernet Franc. So I'm, I'm, I'm really just a fly on the wall here, listening and learning, and but I'm happy to chime in if anybody, you know, needs me to chime in <laughs> on Cabernet please. Franc. Please. I'm jealous, Allison. You get to taste so many Cab Francs. I, I, I wish I had that. that I know. Of, I know. Like, of, uh, you, you literally too. drink more Cab Francs than I think we do. 
I, yeah, I, I drink a lot of Cabernet Franc. I taste a lot of Cabernet Franc. I, uh, I had the pleasure to visit David earlier this year in June, which was an absolute thrill. So uh, I'm very hoping to get to California in, in 2024. Uh, it didn't work out this year, um, but hopefully 2024, I can get to California and do a, a major deep dive because there's, there's uh, so much nuance in the, in the, across the state that I'm excited to explore with regards to the grape. So. Fantastic. Uh, so we kind of talked, we talked about soils. So I want to bring up the concept of clones. So Stephen, I mean, Peter, Peter, you, you have on your tech sheets, the actual clones that, that you use. And I got to find all my paperwork here. Uh, and you've changed your clone. So in 2021, you use clone 214, which I'm going to say is kind of a common clone. We see a lot of 214 out there, but then in 2022, you had clone five and I, I not aware that I've tasted clone five. So let's geek never, out a bit on clones. I have never tasted clone five. Cl um, that vineyard, each one of those vineyards, the 2020 vineyard was in Fountain Grove, ABA. 2021 vineyard was in Chalk Hill and that's the Juan Gamino um, vineyard, which is an impeccable vineyard in Chalk Hill. And that 214 is a wonderful varietal or wonderful clone of the varietal. The clone five is, has never, well, that particular clone five up in Alexander Valley was never made into a single varietal. All of the grapes from the Burnett Ranch are sold to a large winemaker that I can't say the name of, and they never do a single of Cab Franc. They blend it. And I can buy as much Cab Franc from, it's a friend of mine, I can buy as much Cab Franc from him as I want. I think the Clone 5 is a little bit more tannic and a little bit more aggressive. Um, the Clone 214 is more, I hate to use the term because in the industry, some people take it negatively, it's more feminine. It, it's softer, it's more subtle. Um, I, I really do like it. And it, it it's actually grown right next to that particular vineyard has Clone 337 growing right next to it and my neighbor Garo Fernandez actually gets the clone 337 I do the 214 um, I personally and I will never well it's recorded now so I this um, I his 337 I think tastes better than my 214 at harvest I'm going to taste his 337 um, shortly out of barrel and see what it tastes like but um, I think the 337s in that soil is better than the 214, but the 214 is incredible. Um, that, that's actually going to be submitted into the International Cab Franc competition this year as well. But um, I, I think the Clone 5, and I don't know if it's just because of the Alexander Valley where it is, um, I, I, I would agree, agree with Stephen in the sense that I, I, I realize how much less I know every time I talk to people <laughs> Um, like the people on this forum, because I know what I taste and that's what I know. And I know the clone five coming from Alexander Valley is more tannic, more aggressive, more masculine in, in the industry. Now people tend to hate the terms masculine or feminine, but, but you can't say it anywhere now. <laughs> it's, it's much more masculine. The clone five is much more masculine than the 214, but the, the, the 214 um, I would prefer from a soft kind. I'd, I'd love to see the 214 planted in the same soil with that clone five, just to see what they do. But mm -hmm. the clone five, the reason the farmers planted it there was because that's what the people buying the fruit wanted. They want, they wanted something that was more tannic and aggressive to stand up to the Cabernet that they were blending it with. Uh, and yeah. I, I prefer it as a single standalone and what you're going to taste today, by the way, Lori, um, I, I'm, I'm a contrarian to everybody else on here in the sense that I put into 100% new oak. And what you're going to taste today is in a, a Dummy Rouge 1, a Dummy Rouge 2, a Mori Fills, and a Hungarian from European Cooper. So it's all 100% new oak. All right. And that Clone 5 stands up to it really well i think who else wants to talk clone allison you want to chime in <laughs> no I, I i'm happy to i'm happy to chime in um 
I, I have to admit, I don't have as much experience with some of the UC Davis clones, um, but I can certainly uh, provide some insights in terms of my research with regards to the Great Friday. And I was in Bordeaux uh, in June for, and, and David was there as well for the Cabernet Franc uh, symposium that was in saint emilion and uh, what's fascinating is that the clone 214 is the dominant clone globally, um, yeah. which blows my mind. You know, there is so much diversity with regards to Pinot Noir clones. And yet, uh, I would say in France, 50% of the clonal material is 214, 50%, which is wow. insane. And in my conversations with producers all over the world, the dominant clone is 214, which is fascinating and also kind of scary at the same time because obviously the climate is changing, the world is changing. And if 214 perhaps uh, doesn't fare well going forward, we don't know. Um, it's kind of a little bit scary that the majority of the Cabernet Franc vine material out there is all one singular clone. Um, so that as a Cabernet Franc lover has me a little bit concerned. Um, so I'm going to, you know, try and dive a little bit deeper into various clonal materials and, you know, the diversity of, of uh, vine material that we have out there. But uh, it's, it's kind of wild that 214 is, is the, is the clone. I actually, um, uh, I had a, an email exchange with uh, Jean-Claude Berouet, who was the winemaker for Petrus for 40 vintages. And now he's making Cabernet Franc in Southern France, in the re region of uh, in Basque country. And uh, I had an email exchange with him with regards to his Cabernet Franc and he planted 214 in his vineyards in the Pyrenees in Southern France. And when I asked him, why did you choose 214? He said, well, that's the best clone. I'm only going to plant the best clone in my vineyards, and that's the that's the best clone. And I was like, "Wow, this guy made Petrus for 40 vintages. This is amazing, and he's planting 214." So clearly, that says something. Um, but by the same token, um, for anyone on the on the line that has questions about Cabernet Franc clonal material. Uh, I would point them to Herman J. Veemer in the Finger Lakes. Uh, Herman J. Veemer, great nursery, but also wine producer, of course, in the Finger Lakes. Uh, I think right now they're doing, uh, in their nursery blocks, they have experiments with, I think, close to a dozen different Cabernet Franc clones, some UC Davis clones, but also some European clones. Uh, and they're doing various tests and plantings and things like that. So uh they would be a reference that i would direct people to if they're curious about some of the other clones like 327 is the bordeaux clone that is the most common uh they have a couple other bordeaux clones they have a few clones from the pyrenees as well uh that are kind of interesting but they're doing some experimentations across uh, various blocks in the finger lakes with regards to clonal material and um to see what uh how the uh what what else is out there besides the magical 214. Leah, Steven, Mike, clones? Yeah, our, our vineyards have three clones, clone one, clone four, and clone 312. That according to the UC Davis site is also clone 12. <clears throat> um, I find, and we both find that clone one, um, clone one for us tends to go darker. I mean, pulling out from the same vineyard, clone one and clone four right next to each other. So kind of almost grown on the same soils. Um, but clone one tends to be darker fruit um clone 312 um and clone four um both tend to in my opinion produce redder fruit um i find that clone one can handle more new oak um i don't do a lot of new oak i i'm in steven's camp that i don't like um cabernet franc with a lot of new oak um personal style um because i always we've always said that we need to make wine that we like to drink because if nobody buys it, then we've got a lot of wine that we need to consume. Um, so uh, clone one for me just can handle more new oak. Um, it just tends to push that style stylistically than clone 312 or clone four, personally. We, we David, found- Steven? Yeah, we, there, there are a number of different clones planted um, in the Livermore Valley. The 214 is a new addition 
it's oh. I don't think it's it has uh born any fruit yet. I think it's only in its second or third leaf at this point in time. Gilmetti Vineyard has two different blocks of of Cab Franc um and and clone five cal uc davis clone five which i think is the on top clone 332 i believe um so. is, is pretty prevalent in in the livermore valley 331 on top 331 is uh uh the predominant clone at gilmetti vineyard and and it, from my perspective is a much more feminine redder fruited more fruit forward expression of Cabernet Franc than, than 332, which the, the clone five, again, I think bigger, maybe a little bit more sauvage in a way, darker fruited, a little bit more, um, I think when picked properly, a little more of that, um, uh, um, chili, chili peppers, you know, smoked paprika kind of notes that you get the, the pyrazine expression from that particular clone. I, I really like 331 a lot. 214, we have a friend who's planted that. We'll have access to that in a couple of years. So we're very excited about using that as well. Um, cl clones of, of Cab Franc are, are a, a pretty new thing in terms of telling that Cab Franc story clonally. Pinot Noir, we've been doing that for 20 plus years. And, and it's neat to see that there's that there are there are new there are new clones, I think, available to California wine producers that that aren't in the ground yet. And it'll be interesting to see how they how they work in 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 the climate of Livermore Valley or the Santa Cruz Mountains or what have you. But uh, the clone the clone material that, that we have used really I, I di differentiated for us more on weight, more on on um, uh, the the so called the kind of color of fruit, that sense of darkness, blackness of fruit rather than red fruited. Uh, and, what do you say? Weight? You mean mouthfeel? Um, you know, I I I think that that um mouthfeel is certainly part of it we tend to pick relatively early so acid drive is sort of common i think in our wines to independent of the clone but i think from my perspective clone five tends to be um tends to be a it does give you more of a it, it's bigger it has more it has more heft to it let's say okay. not necessarily more acid drive more momentum which i think is more a function of winemaking than it is a clonal material um but uh 331 on top 331 i don't know if there's a uc davis equivalent number to it or not um is is our preferred clone so far uh i don't know what's planted in the santa cruz the uc davis that's clone five uh it, three, it's three, 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 two. Two. Three, three, three two three two is clone five. five uh which we also farm um uh but i i think there is a it, you know, to the extent there can be a, a divide between feminine and masculine in Cabernet Franc, my experience with the clones is that 332 uh, is a bigger clone, expresses itself in, in structurally larger, darker fruited than 331 does, at least at this one vineyard that we work with. David, do you have any clone comments? I, I it, it, it's fascinating. I mean, um, sometimes when you come out of the old world, it really is old. So um, for three quarters, or at least the original Cabernet Franc vineyard that, that I own, would never clue. No document, no anything shows you what it is. Uh, that kind of worries me as well, um, because yeah, uh, it's got so much it's been was, was treated before. We took you know, took care of it, and it means slowly it will. It, you know, its past history will will catch earlier than I would like. Um, we have. We always like to see our vines get older, and I think the earlier comments made by uh, by Mike would would support that. This is a totally different taste to 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 a vine oh, yeah. a fruit that, that's that's twenty plus years old, it's, and that's where you've got to be. And there's no reason if you look after it proper, um, with good care and attention in your soil and your vineyard, that you can't get to some ripe age. Have mullows that are sixty five years old, and I don't see the reason why some of our cab francs won't get there too. Our newest stuff is tends to be two one two one four, um, and I've just looked that up because I've got the still got the invoice that was purchased against it. Um, <laughs> but it does for us raise the comment about looking into more detail, and it's very clear that uh, certainly there the Californian experience is is deeper and, and and much more knowledgeable than than ours would be at, at this stage. It also wants to that if we have got a really nice old wild clone. How we deal with that, 
and um, do we start taking direct cuttings or, 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 or root downs or whatever the, the technical word would be for that? And that's something that now we've sort of changed our, our, our vigneron and looking to move forward and putting more emphasis on soil and, and vineyard again, that we will will certainly uh, certainly look at. But heaven knows what we got. And also, I know a bit more about the rootstock, but there is an effect in there of the rootstock. And certainly, when I was with Alison and we were at Saint Emilion at the Cab Franc Symposium, that was an issue that was also coming up. And based on the recent experience in Bordeaux, which was uh, for only partly impacting on Cabernet Franc, not severely, but the, the Merlot was a wipeout in 2023 and um, in Bordeaux. And uh, that's that's public news, by the way. It's not not, not secret uh, stuff. Is that there's a lot of emphasis going back to check whether there's been, and I know the words and probably biologically are right or wrong. Space is the drift on the the root stocks used, or drift on the clones that are that are grafted in, and this is becoming going to be quite a big issue. But it may also be that the biodiversity inside Bordeaux, particularly on the right bank with regards to Merlot, has pushed it to a certain point. And that may be worth us thinking about and maintaining that biodiversity and range of different clones across our vineyards to really see what that best expression is. And now a word from our sponsor. Did you know that Dracina Wines has a wine club? We named it the Chalk Club. Draco is on our label, but Vegas was getting a bit jealous. So we decided he deserved to be our wine club's books dog. In Las Vegas, betting chalk means that you are betting on all of the favorites, and we're gambling that once you taste our wines, we will become one of your favorite wineries. The club is simple, yet a bit different than most. We don't ask for a lot of commitment like others do. Choose between three tiers, the Sweet 16, where you will receive three bottles twice a year and get 15% off all orders. Sign up for the Elite Eight and get 20% off all orders and receive four bottles twice a year, or make it to the final four and receive six bottles twice a year, as well as receiving 25% off purchases. All tiers receive discounted shipping, are customizable, and are eligible for unlimited referral bonuses. Add $15 to the bank for each person you refer. Head to www.dracinowines.com to use the link in the show notes to find out all the Chalk Club has to offer and to sign up. We've stocked the odds so that you can get our award-winning wines without breaking the bank. So, um, Ricardo, on on the website, you're talking about your uh, Cab Franc, and you are aging it in both amphoras and barrels. So I'm just curious as if you can talk about why amphoras, and then I'll pass it along to everybody else in the round table of, does anybody do amphora? or you know what they think about that concept so ricardo yeah so basically what the winemaker what gonzalo and his team is is trying to do here is to let the cap frank really express its origin um the the whole winemaking process is centered in a very slow maceration uh uh long long uh, sitting of the wine on the lees um low temperature and the fact that he's also doing this aging in amphoras and, and used barrels points to the same objective which is to let the cab frank express basically the location and the soil where it's where it's growing um if you look at at, at, at climate um profile of where we are um rainfall and all that it's pretty it's pretty st- not standard but it's common in the whole region what really makes the difference here is the soil composition so if we want to produce a cap franc which is unique and which really belongs to to our location what we want to do is try to intervene as as it's um as little as possible so that it really brings the location out and that's why he's using mostly neutral uh, uh vats uh, amphoras and used barrels so that 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 product at the end is basically 
a reflection of the location. Comments from the gallery of using of how you're aging, fermenting, what the uh, vessel adds to the Cabernet Franc? I, I think yeah, absolutely. Go for it, Derek. Okay. Go, Steve. I, I just would going to echo the 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 idea of of using as much neutral material as possible for for fermentation and and for aging. The Cabernet Franc is one of the things that's so compelling to me is it's such a beautiful expression of wine. There, there's there's such an, an energy to Cabernet Franc. There's such a beauty to it, and a mystery to it, and a lure to it. Mm -hmm. The more that you mask that with new wood. Um, or, 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 you know, the, 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 the greater the level of bricks or ripeness, as it were, that you pick it at, the more you, in my mind, um, kill off those, those aesthetically beautiful things that make Cabernet Franc such a, a unique variety. And so for, we, we have at, at the Stephen Kent Winery, uh, are using as much neutral oak as we possibly can, uh, if for fermentation, we're in one and a half ton, 1.7 ton plastic bins, basically in a pine enclosure, open top fermenting. Um, we are doing, we're going to be doing some more stainless steel fermenting of, of Cab Franc uh, as we get larger lots from different vineyards in Livermore. Uh, and and we we uh, were, were punching down three times a day early on the fermentation and then back off as we get close to, relatively close to dryness. We're not doing much extended maceration. Uh, with with fruit either we're again trying to i think highlight the more um uh uh evanescent uh aspects of the variety the more um you know the 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 aspects of the the grape that tend to to go away quickly the more you mess around with it so we're we're we we love the idea of neutrality in the aging vessel we're going to be using concrete um this year uh post ml uh aging in in uh, concrete, you know, 240 gallon concrete squares, basically. Curious to see what that adds from a minerality standpoint, what that contributes to fruit or takes away from fruit. But I, from my perspective, I think that there are, you know, one of the, one of the, the worst things you can do to Cabernet Franc is to pick it too late and age it in too much new oak and, um, and, and take away those things, trying to add heft to it and and like consequently take away what's what's sort of um the beauty of it the beauty of the varieties so for for us it's it's trying to do too much you know tr tr try how, to let the how variety how would you, you compare neutrality of neutral oak versus stainless steel I, for, I aging, for aging purposes so I'm, what was the first part of that michael I, so, I so neutrality of a, of a neutral barrel right an old you know 10 year old barrel that doesn't leak <laughs> Right, yeah, right. <laughs> hopefully First, aging in stainless. So we we haven't done a lot of aging in stainless yet. We're we're going to be doing that starting with the 23 vintage. Um the the more the older I get, the less I like oak, the less I like whether it's Cabernet Sauvignon or Cabernet Franc. Um Cabernet Franc to me has a flavor profile, aromatic profile that just gets a, sort of obliterated with too much new wood. There are some there are some right bankish blends that we're working on where there's a, a very small percentage of new wood, uh, but you know, there there is something to be said about being able to sand the corners off of a wine you know in its second year of aging in neutral wood that you don't get in stainless steel. So there's there are textural things that you can accomplish with barrel that are harder to do with stainless steel, for instance, yet still give um, still celebrate. And 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 put you know stage front stage forward those those aromatic and flavor profiles of Cabernet Franc that are, I think so compelling to all of us. Uh, so we were experimenting with different. We, we were in Paso. We went to a winery called Giornata that does Italian varieties, do an amazing job with Italian varieties, and they do a lot of work in larger uh, larger format wood as well as amphora, and it's that's exciting to us to try that as well. Um, uh, as we as we move forward with our program, all in service to trying to create something as pure an expression of Cabernet Franc of a year, of a site, of a clone, of a rootstock, all the terroir driven aspects of the of the wine as we possibly can. We'll let New Oak stand for you know 
the region up north of us <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, sort of overripe fruit, let that be somebody else's um, uh, challenge to define as Gap Funk. We, we want to stick with, with All right, Peter, part. bring it on. Bring it on, Peter. <laughs> well, I, I will just say this much. I agree with the one person earlier who said, I make wine for me because at the end of the day, I might have to drink all my wine. <laughs> so so I don't dis I don't That's disagree true. with anybody. The reality is I've been club member and now that I'm in industry, I'm still club member of seven wineries. And some of those wineries make very, very and I will I'll distinguish between two phrases, old world and new world. Old world typically is a lighter body, but still big flavor. A lot of people think lighter body means lighter flavor. Um, like Bonovia, like Macrosti, like a, a lot of these new world wineries that make old world style. Um, I love them. And I've been a club member of Macrosti since they opened their doors, but I love new world style. My wine is made in new world style. I make it the way I like it. And sometimes like that 2022, you're about ready to taste. Um, they're really, really big and they take time to integrate the oak, which you have to integrate the oak if you use new oak. And I would agree with that, but the wine, the, the fruit has to stand up to it too. And not only that, but the person who tips the glass has to like it. If they don't like it, it sucks. It doesn't matter whether wine's good or bad. It sucks if they don't like it. And I feel bad when people don't like wine I make. But the reality is, to the point of every other winemaker on here, I make wine that I want to drink at the end of the day because I might have to drink all 400 cases a year of it. <laughs> so did that answer? And, and I've drank, I've drank Stephen's wine. I love it. And I thank you very much for hosting last year because that <laughs> or that wasn't last year. That was this year. Cap Francapalooza was awesome. I loved it. It was great. And I had pristine parking right in front of. <laughs> It was awesome. So thank we you. Hope, we're, we hope you're there next year too. No, <laughs> I, I, I loved it. It was great. Thank you. No, thank oh, you. Yeah. Did that answer your Biden's question, just, Lori? I I just want to, you know, I, you know, I'm from Jersey. I like button heads. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's not button heads though, because I'll, I'll drink, I'll drink, drink Cab Franc from across the world and other styles, and it doesn't matter. And it doesn't mean it's going to change my style. It may change what I'm going to drink tomorrow. Mm -hmm. but and it, you know what different different days require different style wines I right? agree. what what mood you are in requires a different style wine what food is on your plate requires so today a style today wine. i love hungarian oak i may not love that next year but i'll tell you this much this is a cab franc call so i hate to say this other varietal but my alicante boucher hates dummy it loves okay. Maury Fills as far as barrels go. As far as dummy goes, dummy costs twice what a Maury Fills cost. But from a French perspective, it tastes so much better coming out of a Maury Fills. And I blend that with a Hungarian and that Alicante Boucher is phenomenal. Um, but I do agree that if the grape can't stand up to the oak, the oak takes over the fruit. And you don't ever want, I don't, I don't want to lose a fruit in a really, really good wine, especially the delicate. And when we talk about the three of mine that we talked about, Fountain Grove is probably the most delicate of all of them. The 214 from Chalk Hill is not delicate. The Fountain Grove was delicate. And that couldn't have dealt with 100% oak, whether it was French, Hungarian, American, whatever. I, I agree and I disagree with everything. <laughs> Does that make sense? Absolutely. That being said, that being said, I will drink Stephen's wine any day of the week that ends in Y and starts with today. <laughs> very much, Peter. <laughs> but Lori, I think um, Peter's Peter's comments are are, are also very key in there. Um, yeah, it, he certainly has a particular style which is a little different from to the, the rest of it there. But in his last sentences there, he talked about fruit and freshness. And, and how you make that expression will depend on how long you want to age it, even in bottle or anything like that. And I, I mean, I think I can vouch for the customers who find their way or lose their way to Santa Million and, and find their way into our winery. And that's the thing with Cabernet Franc that always, always dominates the conversation. It's the pressure is. It's a little bit about crunchy acidity. And man, is that different from a Merlot? And is that different from a Cabernet Sauvignon? 
And I think that's my observation is, and we continue to make lots of wonderful um, experiments, usually called accidents. And um, we certainly, our most recent experience was that our 2022 was, despite the heat and everything, it was a remarkably successful vintage across the whole of Bordeaux. And we had some pretty good volume of that destroyed despite trying to hold it back. So we found ourselves short of barrels. And in that whole process, um, for whatever reason, I could not divide by two and a quarter um, hectolitres to get the right number of barrels. And we ended up with some in, in a vat. And, and Alison can testify that. She was there to, uh, with a glass out in hand, uh, extended to, and to, to soak up that pleasure. What is interesting at the end of that, just having before I left Bordeaux to come back to Australia, is that the we did the potential large for, for the different blend brands will be for the year and it's not something we've done a lot we've got more expertise now and there was a lot of mixing and sipping and spitting and all sorts of stuff one of the things that was most interesting for us was the fact that we did actually put Cabernet Franc into a hundred percent new oak barrel for the first time uh, our observation as a team was mm, never mind David that was a good experiment the barrel will be beautiful for something next year and that barrel in particular has been put to our Merlot Capron blend. And what we did with that, that, that inspired us so much that some of the wine that we had in our stainless steel, that we worked totally in stainless steel. It's so small, you've got to be able to carry things out of the door to clean them with two people and put them back. You know, concrete bunkers and and four just don't work in the same way, I'm afraid. Um, and what we had in the stainless steel vat, we like so much that we've actually been at and turned Bordeaux and it's, we have bought a stainless steel barrel. You heard that correctly. It's 300 litres. It's stainless steel. It's about the same size and shape. And man, there's a lot of fighting going on in that barrel room overnight. You can tell there's a lot of, <laughs> lot of jealousy and, and stuff going on. <laughs> it's going to be fascinating. But when we did the assemblage, you could taste that whatever it is, one sixth percentage, one sixth fraction of unoaked, fresh, crisp Cabernet Franc you put into the blend. Um, my gut feeling is we come back and have this conversation in one or two years' time, there'll be another couple of stainless steel barrels in there. And part of the issue is, as you get better in the view, the quality of your fruit gets better. You, 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 you know when to harvest it better, mm -hmm. and it gets a little bit richer. And um, offsetting that with a bit of freshness and crisp acidity, man, I think that's the way to go. The other thing that Alison will have picked up also is that when you talk to guys in the Loire Valley versus those in the Bordeaux, for the Bordeaux guys, it's very much about, yeah, we had to just take the Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot down a notch. I got it. It really works well. But for people in the Loire Valley, it's a different game. And there they use very much a mixed blend between oak matured Cabernet Franc and and tank matured so i think there's a balance in there somewhere in the future i'm so excited to get back and taste what the end result is like in in april all right so the next thing i want to talk about leah you by far have led the front in the united states for blanc de franc and <laughs> we have followed in your footsteps several of us have now followed in your footsteps and so I want to talk about it in terms of what made you think about doing a Blanc de Franc? Because uh, I know that, you know, Mike and Stephen, we can chime in on that of why we did it. Um, but I think, you know, there's been white cap Francs in the Loire Valley for several years, but you by far were the leader here. Um, so let's talk about the Blanc de Franc and how we have followed suit. And I'm going to shut up, but I'm sure that is why I said previously that Stephen talked me off the ledge because <laughs> I am so, this has been something I've wanted to do for so long and I, I'm nervous. So I keep asking, is this what it's like? Is this what it's like? So uh, Leah, let's talk about your Blanc de Franc and how you paved the pathway for others like us. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I it's the very first wine I made out of the gate. I knew I wanted to make a white cab franc. 
Um, I work up here in Oregon and I was working in cellars where they've been doing white Pinot Noir for quite some time. Um, and just like they use um, Blanc de Noir uh, and Champagne um, with Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, uh, you see that with Cabernet Franc in the Loire Valley for the Cremant de Loire. They have um, a base wine made with Chenin Blanc, Chardonnay, as well as uh, Cabernet Franc. And then of course, as a rosé, sparkling wine, but also still white um, in a Blanc de Noir style. And so I also had the opportunity to taste some white cap frogs from different um, producers. And it's it tends to be more of a, like um, the new generation, younger winemakers who were kind of playing around with cap frog and Meloir doing that. Um, Cause it doesn't have the same designation as like, you know, other, oh, thank you. Other wines <laughs> in, uh, in the Loire. Um, so, yeah, when I I was working harvest, I was working in the cellar at Shea Wine Cellars at the time, and um, I decided that I wanted to make Cabernet Franc. Uh oh, I have a, an invader here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was uh, I was I knew I wanted to make Cabernet Franc, um, and I knew I wanted to do something unique, and so I just. I did an experiment and I thought this is either going to go very well, or this is going to be the dumbest thing I did with 750 pounds of grapes. I, I literally made just a barrel's worth of white cab franc. I just had, I had good mentors who, who had worked with making white Pinot Noir. And so they kind of gave me some tips, but mostly I had to figure it out myself. I just had to figure it out. And the truth is with a white cab franc, um, you know, when you, if you taste it blind, I mean, you could, it can really fool you. It, it can, it, it's still taste, it still holds some of the integrity of, of a red wine in many ways. If you, especially if you're not drinking it ice cold, you can get this, if you have it at a cellar temp, it, it can be a very mind bending wine. Um, and it certainly has been my calling card to a lot of restaurants um, across the country uh, with master psalms who, who've kind of heard about it through the grapevine, so to speak. <laughs> Because I am very under the radar. Nobody knows, who, you know, other than a few cap rock producers, but no one really knows what I'm doing up in Oregon. I'm very small. Um, but it's so it's been in my honor and privilege for um, these wine sommeliers and these master of wine to um, people like Ian Cobbule that are kind of attached to the wine. So, yeah, it's I don't know. It's a, it's um, I guess what I what I would say about producing it. Um, I always I we farm very specifically for this wine and have from from the year that I, I my first vintage was with Lake Lean Vineyard in Walla Walla because that's what I could get. And then the, after that, moving forward, I worked with Herb Quaddy of Quaddy North Wines uh, in Applegate Valley, and we farm specifically. He farms my block um, under specifications is different than anywhere else in the vineyard, and and it's it's become a proprietary thing. And I, and I don't mean that to sound exclusive that we want to help people, but we've we've built this thing over a decade, over a, almost a decade, over just over a decade now, um, and how we farm for this particular block to to reduce the methoxypyrazines to really enhance the fruit character. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a wild, wild ride. <laughs> and do you think, and then I'll let everybody else talk because so Steven, Mike, the whites we are doing this year and Peter, before everybody else got on, Peter is doing a rosé and we had, we had like the, oh my God moment when we were talking. So David, I don't know if you're doing anything or Ricardo, if Mina La Rosa is thinking of Cab Francs in um, different ways, but uh, like what, how exciting is it to be known for something that you just, you're like, yeah, I'm going to wing it and I'm going to make this. Like, I think in the United States, you really are most known for that, for bringing that to the United States. Leah, I used to, Lawrence, there you so, go. Mike, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, but I was having an issue with my with hearing. Oh. <laughs> That's why I was like, "Wait, me? What?" Yeah, yes, you. Um, I'm like, I'm looking in the chat. I'm like, "Wait, no, 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 talk, talk, talk." <laughs> um, so I just was saying that I think that really, in the United States, you mm. are by far the person who has brought that concept to the to the public. And there are other people now, like I said, Peter is, is creating a rosé, Stephen mm -hmm. and Michael, we're, we're making rosé, uh, we're making right. a white cap from David, I don't know, Ricardo, I don't know. So that's what I'm kind of interested in hearing is 
like, what does it feel like to really be a pioneer? Oh gosh. Um, well, I mean, I never thought of myself that way. I, I honestly, um, you know, I've just, I fell in love with Cabernet Franc a long time ago. And my, I'm, my mother's family has been making wine in the Campania since the 1700s. I just grew up with wine and I love wine and the experimental part of it um, has been really part, partially what's driven me is, but also understanding that the nuances of this varietal, I, I really set out to show the, the many um, faces and styles of Cabernet Franc. And, and it's unique the same way Pinot Noir is in that you have acidity and you need that acidity. That's acidity is required if you're going to do a rosé or a blanc cab franc. I mean, if it didn't have natural, my pHs are always like three five when I when I harvest my around three five. That's pretty incredible. Um, and so when I but when I pick my um, cab franc for blanc, it's like closer to like three one whatever. Yeah. Um, so that that acidity is essential. If it's not there it's just there's people I think who want to make an arbitrary white from red and what I'm getting at is this is not arbitrary in any way it right. cab franc can do this because it's been done for sparkling wine for a long time right I get and so it has the ability to wear these different faces if you will because of ostensibly the the structure of the grape the acidity the phenolic compounds the the tannin it, it makes impeccable obviously the red but you know, it, no matter what you're doing, and I, I really am in so much alignment with Stephen, is that this is a varietal that that has been purposefully planted in the United States as a blending grape. We we all know this, um, and so in order to allow Cabernet Franc to sing in her many voices, then you have to farm accordingly. And so, um, even with my blocks for my reserve reds that I, you know. This has been my inspiration for a million since the beginning. Clou Rajard, we opened up a 16 Clou Rajard today. We <laughs> also like, opened up. <laughs> we also opened up the 16 Mararocchio, uh, the Guadalatasso tonight. So we really were playing around with Cabernet from, from 2016 this this evening. Um, and when you are making decisions about your style, whether you're making a white, a rosé or a classic red, a flagship red, that's gonna, you know, see quick um, barrel age and will we'll get uh, vinified quickly versus um, a reserve that you're gonna hold on to and, and keep in barrel longer. I mean, all the different things and all the different decisions you make stylistically, it kind of comes back to farming. And I know how everyone says, great wines are made in the vineyard. And I kind of sometimes want to like gag myself when I say that because it's the most <laughs> overly <laughs> spoken because you know what, that's partially true, but winemaking is very important, very, very important. Um, and so you could take five producers from the same vineyard and you'll taste the difference from that, yeah. from a winemaker's understanding of that varietal. And I'll just say this, that with Cab Franc, I mean, I understand um, methoxypyrazines, and I understand, um, you know, how important temperature is throughout the process, keeping things cool, cold, cold, cold. Um, and so when you understand those things and you're looking for, you know, I'm not going to make, um, judgments on what format you use of, of barrel or amphora or, um, stainless teacher to each his own. It's all about experimentation. As I just said, understanding, I think what you're trying to accomplish from the beginning, again, making a white from a red can be, um, an arbitrary thing. If you're not really thinking about what you're, what you want to accomplish while you're making the wine in the first place. And so a white cap franc can be very whimsical, but it also, for me, was very serious. It was a very yeah. serious wine that I wanted to, um, I took Let's see, 2011 was the year I made it. So it's taken me many years to figure this out. I didn't figure this out in one vintage. It took me many, many years to play with it, test some things out, switch from one format to the next. I used to use oak barrel. I use acacia now. I mean, there's there's one thing I'm I'm happy to share. Like I use acacia barrels because acacia has much more of a um, herbal quality to it. And it brings out the herbal essence of the Cabernet Franc, like elderflower and, and elder bear. It's just stunning. So like you can really play around with things, um, when you know what you, what style, what you want to accomplish. Right. Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's making 
there's making anything, not necessarily wine. There's making anything because it's the in thing to do, or it's making it because it's your passion. And I think everybody who's on this panel, Cab Franc is a passion. It's not just because it it's a thing to do, right? It's a passion. And so I just want to go around. So Peter, you are making a rosé. Quick question before beforehand. Leah, where do you get your acacia barrels from? <laughs> because yeah. I, I I get acacia all day long. I, I've got I've I've got a vineyard owner who who gets cut down acacia. We've made acacia bars. I made acacia bar tops for 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 uh, 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 for sushi houses I love. Where do you get the barrels made out of acacia? Um, yeah, but there, the acacia connection is Peter. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're French. Um, and I have to look up a picture of my barrel because I can't remember the name. And it's ridiculous. So are they French acacia then? They're getting the acacia out of France. They're French, yeah. And oh, okay. they have dragons on the label because okay. i love nice. it because i was watching i was watching game of thrones at the time and i was like yeah i'm the queen of dragons we'll, we'll connect after <laughs> afterwards but i i, yeah. I want to know where you got them from because that's i yeah. we use it for everything else around the winery because we get the acacia free but we're not gonna yeah. i'm not a cooper i can't make barrels okay. yeah no there's 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 um a few resources out of uh out of france that you can you can look into but i i will look up the name of the barrel cool. and I'll, thank I'll, you I'll sorry you. Lori. of course no, no, no problem. That's what we're all about. That's what we're all add, about. Add a quick, add a quick note on acacia barrels. We we've used them uh, at Stephen Kent probably 15 years ago one time for Sauvignon Blanc, and we used one barrel's worth. They are um, black locust, uh, is what the tree actually is, and and it is they're they're very very impactful. They give over their their agree. I agree with. Uh, agree with Leah, um, geranium notes. They, they give floral leafy notes over to wine very quickly uh, it, it, to the tune of three or four months max before we took them out because they were starting to overpower fruit. Um, we haven't used them for white cap franc. I, one of, uh, the white cap franc, we, and, and we, it, it's interesting. Um, um, uh, Leah, Leah is the Janie Appleseed of white cap franc. She's spreading her seeds all over the place. And I picked up a few of them. My wife, Beth, and I were, were visiting with Leah in, in Oregon and tasted her white cap funk a couple of years ago. Love the wine. We did it for the first time last year from Livermore Fruit and uh, didn't make a lot, but it sold out, was received very well. And we, we made a lot more this year. It was interesting to me about it is to kind of subvert that whole pyrazine and skin contact thing that you get with red red Cabernet Franc. It's such a it's such a function. Um, the the wines are such a function of of pyrazine content, how long, you know, and 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 the green or or chili pepper kind of notes that you get from that compound to subvert that and make a wine that doesn't really have that aspect in it to any great degree. Uh, is is really fun to work with. The texture of the wines are, are really cool, um, ronish, white ronish in a way. They're they're much more um, uh, delicious and yummy and rich than you'd expect based mm -hmm. upon based upon you know uh, uh, just prep you know pressing off right away. Uh, really interesting interesting wines to work with, and we're very excited about where that experiment is going to go. So thank you, Leah. We appreciate that. Sorry, just to add to the to the statistics, I was just checking the the composition of our rosé, which does very well, and it's fifty percent Cab Franc. Okay, it's got some Syrah, Malbec, Pinot Grigio, and Pinot Noir, but the most part is Cab Franc. Very All right, we love hearing that. We love, and what is the taste profile of that? So this is a basically this is a simple rosé, um, very nice and fruity, good acidity. But it's a it's a it's a rather simple, not pretentious rosé. Um, why Gonzalo is is choosing to do it ma mainly with Cap Franc? Probably you, maybe you guys know better than I do. <laughs> but it does it does very well, and it's very well received. I mean, it's a beautiful rosé, simple but very nice. I think those wines do really well, Cab Franc rosés, because acid drive in the variety. You know, the, I, I think that the Cabernet Franc works really well with higher acid, lower pH levels and higher acid levels, still abundant flavor, still abundant texture. You don't get watered down 
with like you might with other varieties. So I think that Cabernet Franc is rosé material, and we're doing a couple of different rosés this year as well, work really, really well because you still get viscosity there, uh, even though you're, you're pressing off early and picking generally less ripe than you might otherwise. Good choice. That sounds like an interesting wine. Yeah. I wanted to... Um... I just wanted to chime in briefly and and comment uh, on on this topic, uh, and I would suggest I would say that that Leah's uh, white Cabernet Franc Blanc de Franc is probably one of the best examples of the variety that I've tasted uh, to date, and um, I was really kind of blown away by it. And Cabernet Franc as a white variety, as even as a Rosé variety, is a really challenging grape. Um, to, to vinify and get the juice out and, and get that right balance of the pyrazines and, and all of that mix. And uh, Leah, you've obviously honed your craft with regards to white Cabernet Franc and, and kudos to you on that, on that front because it, it is really an exceptional example of the variety. But I personally, I'm a huge fan of all of the expressions of Cabernet Franc, whether it's sparkling, pet gnats, you know, white rosé, you know, this, I think one, those that are truly passionate about Cabernet Franc, one of the great um, advantages we have from a consumer perspective, as far as telling the story of Cabernet Franc is the fact that there is so much potential for this grape, as far as versatility is concerned, it can do sparkling, pet gnat, white, rosé, easy, juicy, fun, early drinking styles of red, but also structured, bold, uh, you know, more more powerful uh, age-worthy styles of red. So I think um, from a marketing standpoint, which I know is still, I think, a little bit of a challenge for, for some people, they still don't quite understand what Cabernet Franc is. Um, we have a lot that we can kind of put in our tool belt as far as talking about the grape variety and its versatility. And I think that's one of the the really key um, important elements of, of what the grape is as far as uh, its story is concerned. So we we are getting close to uh, our little time frame. If I, I wanted every winery to have a little opportunity to um, you know puff their wings out and say uh, some great uh, you know what their wines have gotten in terms of awards or what we should look forward to in terms of coming from the winery. Uh, what What is exciting you at this moment about your own specific Cabernet Franc? Uh, so uh, Peter, if you don't mind, if you wanna go first, what, you know, what, if you had to say something about your Cab Franc, any awards, anything like that, what would you like to say? Well, the first thing I'm gonna say is I wanna drink everybody else's Franc that's on here. I wanna try that Blanc de Franc, um, <laughs> but, to your point and to your accolades, you got you hooked me into the International Cab Franc Awards. So the 2020 Cab Franc got the best of class and um, double gold. So thank you very much. 21 and 22 are going in as well. Completely different wines because they're different ABAs and different um, soil, different clones, different everything. So thank you very much for, I've learned so much for you guys. So thank you for, from everybody on here. Uh -huh. David, how about you? What what uh you want to final thoughts about your wine winery, anything? Well, I think, look, I think it's the world of Cabernet Franc is becoming progressively more exciting. I mean, um, not only we do we have Cabernet Franc Day, we've got someone like like Alison who's lending her own special um, understanding and tasting of our, our famous variety of the world. I think exciting. Um, moves. I mean, you know, probably too useful for, for you guys that are down the uh, the left-hand side of the United States or South America, but Cabernet Franc Symposium was a massive step forward in terms of the realisation that this is a great variety that is going to have a huge impact in the wine world in the future. Um, you know, the Europeans haven't yet come off the blocks, but they're starting to do that and working it out slowly. Marking is not in that trait. Um, you know, we've got the, the, you know, we had the Cab Franc of Palooza. We have now the Cabernet Franc Masters 2024 coming up in, in January. There's a lot of exciting stuff seeing, and I'm seeing it even in Bordeaux. I'm seeing, you know, as Merlot becomes uh, a bit, bit icky and difficult on a number of, number of measures, 
uh, you know, climate disease resistance and all of that, Cabernet Franc is coming back into it. And when grown properly, we can help the Bordeaux understand to grow it properly, look after their soils properly, then you'll start to see Cabernet Franc really become much more back in the mainstream. And as we've discussed today, it offers so much variety in so many different formats. It's exciting future. And uh, Ricardo, you got, you've got some serious accolades coming. That's, that's true. And what I wanted to add is that I've been working for the winery for 20 years now, and we have a, a variety of, of, of grapes in our portfolio. But in the last five years, Cap Franc has risen to the top incredibly and and it's not because as as you said before uh, people are looking for it but it's it's turning out to be the most expressive variety of our portfolio and we've got some really serious uh, accolades we got 94 plus with robert parker we've got 93 94 with uh, allison cooper uh, allison cooper alistair cooper and some other uh, masters of wine 95 uh, 95, 95. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so basically, I mean, I'm very excited about the potential that this grape is offering to us also. Um, as I said before, you, you got to really pick your your the, the, the wines that you really shine with because there's so much wine out there. You want to bring something that's really unique to you, what you do well and what makes you stand out. And in our case, we've been... Uh, We've been trying Cabernet Franc for the last 10 years. In the last five or three years, we really understood. And Gonzalo came to his nature with this variety. I mean, he really found himself with Cabernet Franc now lately, and he's doing great wines. And I'm, I'm happy to, to sh hopefully share these wines with you guys, with you guys in, in, in the near future. Thank you. Leah? Um, yeah, I don't submit my wines for um, competitions and I've stopped submitting wines for scores. Um, instead, I've um, I've been very lucky to have some nice um, editorial food and wine in me, one of the top 15 women winemakers in the world uh, for my work with Cabernet Franc and um, enthusiasts named me one of the eight innovative winemakers out of Oregon. So I've had some really nice, lovely for my work with Cabernet Franc. Um, so I've had some, I've been very lucky to have some nice, uh, press through that, but yeah, I don't, I don't do, um, I don't submit for, uh, numbers. You're a pioneer, that. Leah, and it's <laughs> not all, it's, it's not all about the points. It, you really, I see articles after articles about you and your, and your wines and they are beautiful wines and you really are in the forefront of Cabernet Franc. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Michael? I'm not going to puff our chest up on our 21s that were submitted because we don't have a lot of it left. So we're uh, our 93 and 92 on our um, on our reserve and our classic. But one of the things I'm really looking forward to is is the uh, the 23 white cab franc that we're long to franc that we're working on. Very, very, very tiny amounts. Um, and the other, Stephen, I will uh, I will let you know how it turns out because I've got a split fermentation um, Two of that in neutral oak and one 33 gallon stainless of the exact same fermentation batch to let you know what stainless does in aging. Very so good. looking forward to it. Cool. Well, he's not gonna he's gonna not gonna boast, but I am. So our reserve Cabernet Franc 2021 was did receive 93 points in uh, decanter, but more importantly, a little little itty bitty guy like us was named as one of the top 30 wines in the 21 vintage of Paso in Decanter Magazine. So it, that is uh, to see our name up against, or not up against, but up with some of the big, the big, you know, leagues of Paso was, uh, I'm not gonna lie, I cried. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's awesome. And Steven. Uh, well, you know, I, I, we were in the midst of, of having new wines come out, new vintages come out, and we, we have done, you know, well with, with, uh, with the scores on the, on, on our Cab Francs and, and other wines that we do. I think more, more importantly for what we're trying to accomplish, I, I, I don't think it's, 
I don't I don't think what I see happening in the marketplace and what I see happening in fora like this um, is uh, sort of that Bider Mon Monhoff kind of um, you know you only see what you're doing you know it's that that kind of bias I think we're actually starting to see a little bit of a movement here and that's extremely exciting um, you've got one chance to get you know to 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 have a wine career or any other career. And our goal has always been to try to make the most beautiful and best wine we possibly can. We're lucky to, we're lucky in a way, and it's been very, uh, uh, maybe a hard, hard fought kind of realization for me, but being in Livermore Valley and, and focusing on Cabernet for as long as we have Cabernet Sauvignon, we've been lucky to stay in business. You know, we've been lucky to be able to compete a little bit with the, with, with Napa Valley and the like, and, and really focusing on Cabernet Franc over the last 15 years, 10 to 15 years is, has brought a great deal more satisfaction and a great deal more sense that, you know, we can be leaders in something rather than trying to bat our head against the 100 pound gorilla, especially with something that's as beautiful as Cabernet Franc. I love Cabernet Sauvignon as well, but it doesn't hold a candle to the just the sexiness of, of Cab Franc, which is, in, I think we all agree, is undeniable. Um, we're, we're, we're excited about the future in our region. We're excited about the future of Cabernet Franc in, in the U.S. Uh, we last year um, started, uh, my wife and, and two friend, close friends of ours started a, uh, a festival called Cab Franc Palooza in Livermore. And last year, um, Mike and Lori and Leah and Peter and David's wines were all involved in various events that we had kind of surrounding the weekend. And uh, uh, to great acclaim, I think, some amazing wines. It was a real pleasure to taste David's wines and Peter's wines. Leah's wines I've known for a while. Um, Dracina wines, excellent. We'd love to have more folks. We had, I think... What did we have? We had 30 wineries on the Grand Taste and we had 500 people show up to Livermore. We had seven states and five countries uh, represented for Cab Franc and would love to have Ricardo's wines involved and and uh, David's wines again and everybody else um, who who uh, is a lover of Cab Franc to continue to grow this audience um, in, in a variety of different areas around the country. So we will be in contact with you all. We hope that we hope that it works out for everyone May 3rd through 5th next year for Cap Franc Capalooza number two. Uh, I, I just, you know, I'll kind of finish my soliloquy here by saying that um, it's a joy working with people like you, uh, people who are um, in, in touch with, with not only the business side of wine, which is important, we wouldn't be here if we couldn't sell enough wine to stay in business, but who are um, at the forefront of, of, of sharing something that's truly beautiful, something that's more difficult than it is easy to sell right now in some instances. Uh, but it, it's, I'd, I'd rather spend the rest of my career, I hope it's a long one, um, forging a path for my kids and for my grandkids and for other people who believe in the beauty of Cabernet Franc than it would be to sell Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, so thank you all for your inspiration. Thank you all for your amazing wines and, and, Look forward to uh, many more of these get-togethers, virtual and and real. And in real life. Thanks, Amen. Lori. Thanks, Lori. Thank you so much, everybody, thank for you, coming. Lori. Thank you. Uh, and honestly, thank you all for your passion for Cabernet Franc, because it is near and dear to my heart. And I'm sorry, there's just no other better, great variety than Cabernet Franc. It is the best. It's so true. <laughs> yeah. Have a wonderful night. Have a rest of Cabernet Franc night and enjoy. And thank you, everybody. Cheers, everybody. You well. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, all you guys. Have a Cabernet Franc day, everybody. Bye, bye. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. The Bible water got turned right into wine. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Bud. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com and sign up for my newsletter at exploringthewineglass.com. If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe to help others find me more easily. And most importantly, tell your wine-loving friends, because if you like the podcast, they will too. 
Podcast music is Wine by Kevins. Until next week, slancha. Right now. Nah.